and welcome to the big Jubilee Read uh, for this special Commonwealth Pride event. My name is Uli and I'm a book reviewer and one of the booksellers at Gaze the Word Bookshop in Bloomsbury in London. Uh, you may have heard of Gaze the Word. We are the bookshop that features in the 2014 film Pride about lesbian and gays support the Welsh miners. Um, I'm very lucky to work in such a wonderful institution and I'm even more lucky to be with you here today for this special event. The Big Jubilee Read is a reading for pleasure, who doesn't like that, campaign, celebrating great reads from across the Commonwealth to coincide with the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. As an expert panel of librarians, booksellers and literature specialists have chosen, chosen 70 titles from a Reader's Choice long list, with 10 books for each decade of the Queen's reign. The list offers brilliant, beautiful, thrilling, and in the instances of the two incredible books we're going to be discussing today, brutal, powerful, challenging, extraordinary writing. Um, writing produced by authors from a wide range of the Commonwealth countries over the last 70 years to engage readers all over the world with discovery um, and celebration of great books. The Big Jubilee Read is delivered by a national charity, the Reading Agency, which tackles life's big challenges through the proven power of reading in partnership with BBC Arts. It receives funding from the Arts Council of England and is supported by Libraries Connected and the Booksellers Association. This event is in partnership with Libraries Connected South East. Um, I'd like to uh, get straight to saying a little hello to, um, to both Marlon James and to Douglas. Marlon, where am I speaking to you from today? I am from the United States of Brooklyn. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, Douglas, where are you beaming to us from today? I am actually not too far away from Marlon. I am also in New York. You're in New York. So is it, is it morning there? It is. It's early. It is. The sun's shining. Yeah. <laughs> early? Are you both awake? Are you ready for this? <laughs> no, we're ready. <laughs> Always ready. <laughs> Excellent. Glad to hear it. So now I'm going to introduce um, both authors slightly more formally. Um, Douglas Stewart was born and raised in Glasgow. After graduating from the Royal College of Art, he moved to New York, where he began a career in fashion design. Shuggy Bain, wow, what a book. His first novel won the 2020 Booker Prize um, and both debut of the year and book of the year at the British Book Awards. I recently went to the Brit British Book Awards. It's a lot of fun. Um, Shuggy Bain was also shortlisted for the US National Book Award for Fiction, among many other awards. And Douglas is currently writing the script for the TV adaptation, Can I Please Have a Cameo? Uh, Young Mungo, Douglas's um, uh, second novel, Douglas's incredible second novel, um, was published in April and was a Sunday Times number one bestseller, and so it should be. Um, and then uh, Marlon, um, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to connect with Marlon today. I've long been a fan of his amazing, amazing work. Uh, Marlon is the author of the New York Times bestseller, A Brief History of Seven Killings, The Book of Night Women, which we'll be discussing in more detail today, um, John Crow's Devil and the Dark Star Trilogy. Um, a Brief History of Seven Killings won the 2015 Man Booker Prize, the American Book Award and the Ansfield Wolf Award for Fiction and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. That's a bit of a tongue twister. It's a um, <laughs> That's a lot. Uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Um, um, I'm gonna uh, pause here, um, which the way I hand sell that novel in my bookshop, Marlon, um, is by saying it's as if Marlon turns my, my mind um, uh, and my imagination into a jungle and then he sets it on fire. As soon as I say that, they grab the book out of my hands and buy it. It's um, oh my God. It's you're a good man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's easy to sell work of this quality. Um, it's uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, one of my favorites. Um, the first book in the Dark Star trilogy. It was a Sunday Times number one bestseller. Um, uh, the um, uh, the second book, which I have not read, but I'm going to devote some time to reading. I, I think I really want to feast on um, the second book, Mo Moon Witch, Spider King, that was recently published in 2022. Um, the Book of Night Women won the Minnesota Book Award and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, as well as the NA. ACP Image Award. Marlon, is a, is, Marlon James is a professor at Malacasta College in St. Paul. He divides his time between Minnesota and New York. 
So uh, we're going to be talking um, about the divergent uh, territories of the Commonwealth from Glasgow uh, to Jamaica. Um, have you ever been to Jamaica, Douglas? I have never been to Jamaica, actually. I've never been to the Caribbean at all. What, what about you, Mullen? Have you spent any time in Scotland at all? I have. I have. Been, well, most of for the Edinburgh Book Festival. Um, uh -huh. I was there as the last time I was there was actually quite a while ago. All the I'll be there in August. Um, but yeah, I have. Uh, it was yeah. I'm, I remember because I think I think me and a writer Ryan Gattis crashed a gallery art gallery party that we weren't invited to. <laughs> But you got, but you got it anyway. You crashed the party. It was good. It was awkward in all the ways that writers like. Or like, we can write about this one day. <laughs> Let's do it again when we're in uh, Edinburgh this August, Marlon. I'll come yeah. to crash a gallery. Yeah. Oh my God, you're gonna be there. I am. I am. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah. I'll see you there. Mm -hmm. So for today's event, we are going to be talking about two extraordinary novels, and we're going to start with The Book of Night Women by Mullen James. Um, Mullen, uh, it's a real honor to uh, talk to you about this incredible book. Um, it's one of those books um, that I will never, ever, ever forget. Um, the book is set uh, during the period of British colonialization of Jamaica. Um, uh, in the thanks section of The Book of Night Women, you write, thanks to the history I learned and the history I had to unlearn. What did you mean by that? And can you tell us a little bit about how you researched this novel? Yeah, the very first thing I remember ever learning to, to um, recite by heart was Christopher Columbus discovered Jamaica in 1494. Mm -hmm. And they had us memorize that. And I'm three years old and pretty much that's the first line of history I ever learned. Um, you know, t t I mean, on one hand, I was pretty much blessed that by the time we got to the 70s and 80s, um, you know, a lot of the colleges in the Commonwealth were seized with some radical politics. So we started to see things like slavery and colonialism for what it was. But I really wasn't raised that way. I, you know, I grew up to taking Enid Blyton as a fact of life. Um, you know, and Dick and Dora and, and all these sort of very British stories and, and, and Paddington and so on. And the, the books in themselves aren't necessarily bad. Well, I'm, actually, some of Ian Blyton is quite atrocious. But um, it was, it, you know, I, I was raised in a sort of education to be part, to be part of the colony. You know, I was talking to, who was I talking to? It may have been Salman Rushdie I was talking to about this, about um, how our struggles with English. Because it took me a while to realize the English language I learned is what the butler speaks. And we, we colonial English is a very servile and verbose kind of English. It's to the point where sometimes when people are talking to me, I know I can just walk away because by the time they get to the point, I'll be long gone. That's so how, how bad it is. The point being that I had to unlearn all of that. Even the, the, there, there exists out there, and it probably won't show up till my death, an alternative version of this book that's in standard English, whatever that might means. I mean, I didn't get far with it because I knew that was not the book, but it took me, it, this book was where I learned to trust the voice coming out of my own mouth. Because we were raised to think it's broken English, meaning something about it needs to be fixed. Um, you know, or it was just, it was just bad. And, 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 and believe it or not, the biggest objectors to this novel have been Jamaicans. In the sense that, you know, I studied, I had a college education, I'm an English teacher, why am I writing in this terrible language? Um, but that's also one of the other things I had to unlearn, I had to unlearn just the very way in which I valued my own voice in order to write it. Because honestly, I fought that character for halfway through that book because I'm like, this is not how it should sound. It should sound proper. I mean, I know my Jane Austen. <laughs> and, um, and that was it. That was the, the kind of education and the type of socialization and the type of internalized inferiority I had to unlearn in order to write it. The Book of Night Women is a story about the endless, inescapable living nightmare trauma of slavery. It's pretty much an orgy of sadism, of black slave existence trapped in brutality of rape, of torture 
and of murder, characters living on the constant, constant precipice of mm. brutality and annihilation. Why did you want to tell this story? Because it really hasn't been told. Um, you know, that's the thing. I think, um, and it's, and it's, and we're we're actively for trying to forget this more and more. There are novels on on American slavery, um, beloved. Yeah, um, how, I mean, it hasn't aged very well, but Uncle Tom's Cabin. There hasn't been a lot on on Caribbean and British colonial um, slavery, and it was a very different thing. Um, it's and it's not just that it's not just of highlighting brutality. In fact, I thought I let I thought I let history down. Um, I told people, I mean, you think my book is bad. I, I pulled back. It actually was way worse than that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to, you know, wanted to highlight that these people still live, that these people still had lives, that even in the midst of atrocities, they found laughter. They found they found their humanity. Some of them even found a way, their own way to self determination even in such a in, in in such a landscape and all of that was also important to me even the whole writing it in slave dialect to me was a reclamation um that they, they, these characters are telling you know are telling their own stories but the main reason you know is because it wasn't there and um you know tony morrison talks about writing the books she wants to read and really that was it i you know if I had read this book, I wouldn't have written. If I read this book, I wouldn't have written it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the setting of the novel? What and mm. where is Montpellier? Montpellier? Sorry. I'm so Montpellier, to... Montpellier doesn't really exist. It could have. Um, it's a Jamaica in the seventeenth, well, eighteenth and nineteenth century, which is a very, a very, very um, different place. Um, you know, British British colonialism wasn't quite like Spanish colonialism. There's a big difference between Puerto Rico and, and Jamaica or Cuba and Jamaica. The Spanish built built as if they're going to live there. Um, the British built as if they're passing through. So the, the, there is this. There is always, at, you know, there's always at that time a sense of precariousness, a sense that this could fall apart, a sense that the slaves are going to rebel, and there was a culture of constant rebellion. There was also a culture of extreme and repressive control. You also have a, 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 a you know, a world that's almost, you know, it almost inordinately populated with men. Um, men seeking their adventure, men seeking wealth, men seeking to, you know, rape with impunity, you know. Um, it's just, a, it was this sort of powder keg of a place. And um, I mean, half of the, the, the challenge of writing it was just to rein it all in. I want to come to the, uh, the principal character of the novel, um, which spans the period of Lilith's birth in 1985 to uh, a plantation rebellion in around 1801. Tell us about green-eyed Lilith. Mm -hmm. I was gonna go 1985. She was born the year of Raspberry Beret. But anyway. <laughs> oh, did I say, uh, did I say 1985? <laughs> <laughs> well, good musical knowledge. I like how detailed. Sorry. You know, sorry. Um, I was deep in I was deep in my Prince Mania in 1985. <laughs> we're it's a good place to be. Anyway, 1785. Um, oh god, I forgot the question now because you made me think about Prince. So uh, tell us about Lilith. You know, she the best thing I can say about her is that she was never meant to be the main character of that book. I, this is what something that always happens to me and I keep trying to make it stop and it never does, is I start writing about a character, I fall in love with somebody else and I completely dump that character, I run off with the other one. I elope with characters all the time. And I wrote this book set in the 1830s and somebody mentioned a woman over there. That woman has something to tell you. And that woman was Lilith. And of course, then I became fascinated with, okay, who is that woman over there? And I, I, I was going to write about her, write a sort of an experimental dialect chapter and get back to the true story. And once I started writing about her, I couldn't stop. And I became really, really curious and really, really excited and really, really 
sort of scared of her and what what is it what is she hiding and that's how she came about so she really she really wasn't even meant to be a main character she just stole the book from me and um and 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 she is kind of that person as well it's um she you know in in some ways Lilith is the only character in the book who's unaware that she's a slave and when she becomes aware, it's devastating. And it leads to all the sorts of decisions that leads to a lot of drama, a lot of tragedy, some bloodshed, some humor. It actually leads to love at one point. Um, but it's it's a, it's a character who, you know, is born in a world where self-determination is the one thing you don't get to have. And that is the one thing she shows throughout the whole book. I mean, she's she's an interesting character. She's she's a, she's a character of kind of opposites in many ways. I mean, there's incredible fragility to her, um, mm -hmm. but there's um, th there's incredible power, dark power to her as mm -hmm. well. Um, can we explore this kind of duality to her nature? She 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 she's kind of riddled with an, an internal sense of conflict between kind of two identities or between two racial identities or two allegiances. Can you speak to a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, the first thing is uh, that was important for me was that she be, that she that she would be complex and complicated and that a lot of characters are dealing with sometimes, you know, combative aspects of their own nature. Um, for her, she's one of the one, you know, she doesn't look it, but she is mixed. Except for the, you know, except for the green eyes. Um, you know, she is a mixed, she is, she is the, um, you know, mixed race. And she, more than nearly anybody else, sees how that plays out. Because just because you have some element of whiteness don't mean it, you know, half white don't mean half free. Um, and, and, you know, and that, those, that sort of dueling aspect, that dueling conflicts does drive her over the edge. When she starts the novel, she's not even a slave. Um, you know, and you know, and she didn't realize how precarious and how temporary, you know, that that was, and that's what sort of, um, you know, throws her into this kind of into into this huge crisis when she, you know, she does something that that she can't, you know, she can't turn back from. You mentioned earlier that it was a pretty conscious choice to talk about slavery through the prism of of women specifically mm -hmm. why did you choose to do that i think it chose me honestly i you know some of my some of my best literary ideas come from me overhearing other people or in a conversation with somebody else i was actually a good distance in this novel didn't have a name for it yet when i spoke to a poet um rashida abubakar she's from the congo and I was telling her what I was writing. And she says, you know, um, you know, most ancient African societies are matrilineal. You know, most of them, the women made the decisions. The women decided when to plan. The line of the line of um succession is through is through the female, um, which is something that then crops up in, in Black Leopard Red Wolf. Um, and it just hit me, what if what if there was a sort of a power circle of black women on a slave plantation? Who who are who wield that kind of authority, but nobody knew. Okay. Um, and that's how that that's how that happened, actually. Who who are the night who are the night women in this book? Who tell me about the night women? You know, there is a line in the book where a character says, "This is why we're dark," uh, and you know, because we, because in the night we become one with spirits, we become one with nature. You know, we become one with the everythingness of the world, and I think that's who they are. That's, um, you know, it's it was it's 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 when it's it's women who, at nighttime, realize their freedom because they're the same they're the same color as sky. You know, they're the same color of everything that's in the expanse, and I think that ultimately is why they are, you know, night women. Um, I'd, I'd like to speak about um, uh, another character. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Homer um, and uh, and her relationship with Lilith, and um, maybe within the context of that, um, about 
about slaves secretly learning to read in the novel and the importance of reading and books um, in their relationship. Well, Book of Night Woman actually is a book about books. And uh, Lilith's crisis, her first major crisis happens because she's reading Joseph Andrews and she's seeing these all these men, you know, all, all these white British men of reputable character, even in a book with a, a bunch of rogues like Joseph Andrews. And then she's looking outside her window and don't see these kind of men. And and that's and that's her crisis that the world of literature and the world of life are not the same, and that the men the the, the men in these books, you know, are nothing like the men she, she's seeing in real life. So her first crisis is quite frankly a literary crisis, uh, because those things are you know those things aren't adding up. But reading was power. And there are ways in which, you know, sometimes you're lucky and you come across that one white person who taught you to read, sometimes mistakenly. Sometimes it's because a lot of slave children and master children grew up together, they end up learning some rudimentary stuff. But, you know, a slave who could read was a slave who was killed because that they, 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 they didn't realize it. You know, it's funny, every, every, time nearly every time on i'm at some lit festival somebody brings up this pretentious stupid question about why read why are novels important why are literature important and blah, blah blah should we even bother which is usually the the dumbest part of the interview and i'll say you know what's really interesting enemies of literature always know literature is power book burners know why they're burning books you know, book banners know why they're banning books. Yeah, people people who hate books know full well why we need to destroy them. It's people who love books who don't seem to understand. Um, and the same goes for reading. It's 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 the it's a slave driver who knows how dangerous a reading slave is. The slave don't know, doesn't know. So it's it's always interesting how that is one of the things that has endured after hundreds of years. It's always the enemies of books who know books power. It's um, an incredibly um, intense, um, uh, often um, terrifyingly violent, um, transportive uh, book. But um, within that um, and in relationship to it, um, there are moments of tenderness. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about um, Lilith's relationship with Robert Quinn? Yeah. Well, before that, there is also tenderness between her and Homer. You're asking about Homer before, and I realized I didn't answer that question. Sure. That um, one of the tensions of this book is the natural human nature to form relationships. Um, in the absence, you know, gay men notice in the absence of a mother, you'll find a mother. You know, in the absence of brothers and sisters, you'll find brothers and sisters. You will, in the, if, if you can't have family, you'll make one. And, uh, it, and, and, and the tension in this book is the natural, the natural movement of people to make family, but the systems that keep shutting it down. So Homer and Lilith are almost mother and daughter. They're almost big sister, little sister, but the, wor the, the world gets in a way so it ultimately can't happen. Um, Homer and Robert Quinn are almost a couple. You know, they're almost in a loving relationship. Quinn thinks they're together because the Irish were the first slaves, which is not true, by the way. Uh, um, yeah, but Lilith already knows this, this is not gonna happen. You know, this, this relationship has a sell-by date. And I think that's it. I think there is the natural instinct of people to be together, going against systems dead set on keeping people apart. Were, were there a lot of Irish people in uh, Jamaica in the late 1800s? Um, I wouldn't say a lot, but they, you know, the British were still very big on hierarchy and they still needed a, a, a class of white people below them. Enter the Irish and the Scottish. Yeah. <laughs> so they can still, because you can't just have white people and slaves because then I'm going to have to think you're my equal and you're not my equal, you're Irish. <laughs> You know, or your Scottish. So they, they, they were still, and it still persists to this day, by the way, in most of the Commonwealth, this idea of class. 
So there were there were people who were there just to make a living, just to make a quick buck, whatever. But that there were enough people that the social stratification from the quote unquote mother country still could persist. This may be an impossible question um, without a billion hours um, uh, to answer uh, it. But um, what would you say the um, the impact of colonial colonialism is on Jamaica today? I mean, there are. Ton I mean, the impact is still there. It's um, you know, I'm sure we're going to get to it about you know the remnants of the British Penal Code, and and lots of stuff that's that's still. Um, in the Commonwealth, um, we have this language. We have this language that we have um, a very conflicted relationship to. I write in English. I have an extremely conflicted relationship with it, to to English. Um, at the same time, you know, my literary coming of age is an English literature coming of age. Um, you know, Marquez and Thomas Mann. And all those guys would have been later because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have encountered those cat writers until college. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the 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 legacy of colonialism is pretty much ninety percent terrible. Um, there are aspects of it that yes, we we the the the, the fact that we are that we are in conversation with countries that we might not have been con in conversation with. You know, happened. I'm not sure. I mean, the road to to Chino Achebe might have been longer if there wasn't, you know, um, that the sort of link, the link, and the things, the things we have in common. But I think we, you know, we can't escape the complexity and complication um, that comes when we talk about this history. Well, if you don't mind me asking, when was the last time you uh, you were in Jamaica? I was last time in Jamaica was two days ago. Nice. Um, you know, because I was there, I was there um, um, shooting a TV show that actually reckons with Commonwealth and Empire in its own ways. And and you feel safe going back to to Jamaica as you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I mean, we can talk about it. We, I'm sure we are. We're going to talk about it. Um, that it is complicated being a gay man in a country that's famous for homophobia, but I also think it's complicated. I think it's complex. And I think when you look at homophobia and a colonial lens, there are a lot of things we need to look at. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I still get questions about it. You know, I mean, with, with, you know, people just simply assume, I mean, a few years ago, no, it was a few years ago, maybe a year or two ago, somebody asked me, you know, what's it like being in the most homophobic country in the world? And I was like, damn, I had no idea Jamaica was spelled R-U-S-S-I-A. <laughs> but thanks for telling me. <laughs> Um, and, and you're right, Marlon, we will uh, talk a little bit more about LGBT plus rights in the Commonwealth a little bit later on when uh, when we speak uh, with both yourself and uh, Douglas. Um, but um, for now, um, uh, thank you for um, uh, exploring this incredible um, book. Um, I can't tell you how incredible um, uh, um, it is. I will be uh, putting this into people's hands for the rest of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now um, we're going to move on to uh, the wonderful uh, Douglas Stewart. Douglas, it's so nice to see you again. I hope you're well. I am well. It's great to see you, Uli. Yeah. So um, I suppose at its heart, um, at, at its heartbreaking heart, Douglas, uh, Shuggy Bane is a novel about a child trying to hold a mother together as she crumbles through pain and through alcoholism. Why did you want to write this story? Oh, I don't know that want is a is a word. I think I couldn't help but write the story. Uh, obviously, I'm a man who grew up in a community that was racked by addiction in the in the 70s, 80s and 90s. As you know, I come from Glasgow, Scotland. I grew up there. And, you know, I grew up within a family that was a very proud working class family. We didn't have very much, but we were happy with everything we've got and everyone in the family and everyone around us sort of turned as soon as we could at 16, uh, turned away from education and went and got work. Um, that was the thing to do. But the truth is, is the 70s and the 80s saw Glasgow deindustrialize much too rapidly. And so it made an awful lot of people unemployed, but it also denied a lot of people their future. 
And so I really wanted to write about this book about a, a kid trying to save a parent because that was really how I grew up. You know, my own mother suffered with addiction. She was a super capable woman. She was well loved. She was gregarious. She was a wonderful mother. She was funny, intelligent, generous. Um, but she was also deeply hurt by by the life, by the hand that life had dealt her. Um, and she lost her struggle with addiction when I was 16. And so I'm not sure want was something I wanted to do, but I felt like I had to do it. I couldn't, I couldn't proceed with my life until I told this story. And in fact, for the 10 years that I wrote the book, Uli, I didn't know that anyone would ever read it, to be honest. I thought I was writing this as a way to sort of untangle some knots from myself. And not also to understand what happened with addiction, but to understand the root causes of how we could get to that point as a society where we're so where my own family and then families around me were losing people in this in this way. And so it was a it was a very personal project for all of that time. And um, and now it's in the world, I suppose. And what are your thoughts on that? How, how, like about how we get to a, a place where I, um, problems like this are so endemic. And I, I suppose I, I'm asking that question specifically in relationship to Scotland, specifically in relationship to Glasgow. Well, I think it's fascinating that we're having conversations about colonialism because it's a we have a complex, naughty relationship uh, in that way. Obviously, a lot of the British cities uh, have had some blood on their money and on their growth and we've had such a, a difficult relationship with colonialism both in an outwards way in the fact that Glasgow was known as the second city of the empire when it was booming because we were such an economic powerhouse but so much of our uh, economic power came from from merchandise came from the mercantile sector and that came through rum it came through sugar it came through tobacco and so Glasgow obviously has a very complicated relationship with places like Jamaica and it was a city that grew and it boomed and it boomed all the way through the 19th and 20th centuries. But then it was a city that collapsed quite quickly um, from the 1950s on. And after it had, had all of this wealth and had been so important to the United Kingdom, really, we felt it from the 1950s on, like the, the, the Westminster government, like London, like England, let's say, turned away and didn't want to look at us and didn't want to deal with us. And so not only was it about the fact that by the time I'm born, unemployment is heading towards 26% in my communities, but it was the fact that we felt so utterly abandoned, I think. Um, and so that's also an imperial relationship. You know, that's a, that's a remote government that takes all of your resources, all of your power, and then governs you from afar. And when you fail, they don't come to assist you. They don't come to bring any new opportunity to you. So I love the fact that Marlon and I are actually talking today. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, I felt like I had to write that story, you know, so much of our industrial working class fiction in the United Kingdom, at least, comes from a very sort of heterosexual place, because obviously when places deindustrialize, it's the men that are on the front lines, they're on the picket lines, it's their jobs that are, uh, that are threatened, it's their identities. But I was the son of a single mother, uh, you know, our father left, my dad left when I was only four years old, and he never looked back. And so my entire experience of a deindustrializing community was, was seen through the lens of my mother. And so it was a very feminine view of the world. And so we didn't have very much agency at that time because she was also reckoning, or the characters in the novel are reckoning with that traditional bargain that they've made with it, you know, get married, raise a family, everything will be all right. Just work, you'll have this little house and everything will be all right. And suddenly women like Agnes Bain in the book are marooned, the tide goes out. They haven't invested in themselves. They haven't had access to education. They haven't, you know, known to think of themselves first. And really, they're just left marooned. And I thought, that's a story I have to tell. So there's so many contributing factors to what would lead a community into addiction, what would lead a character like Agnes Bain. It's really hard to parse out any of them. But I think if you were to say it was something, it's about that loss of hope. Um. I want to talk more about the imploding star at the heart of this book. Let's talk more about Agnes. Um, uh, tell us about her, paint a picture of her as a woman, as a character. Yeah, actually, it was, you know, Agnes really is the heart of the book, and I probably should have called the book Agnes Bain. I was just, uh, I thought Shaggy really was the splinter of hope that came off of this, this mother that was losing her battle. 
But Agnes is a very, in many ways, a very ordinary woman. She is a Catholic Glaswegian housewife and she's done everything that, that really was expected of her. She raised her children. She has a small council house. Her dreams are quite modest. She wants a little bit of glamour. She wants to be loved by her husband. She wants to get out and see the lights and dance every so often. You know, she doesn't have big lofty dreams. But because of some of the things that happen with her philandering husband and because of the community and the lack of opportunity that are available to her, she's not going to reach these modest dreams. And so she begins to collapse in on herself. But she's a woman who has an enormous amount of self-worth. She, she molds herself after almost like a Glaswegian Elizabeth Taylor. So she believes in the power of uh, glamour. She believes in what it means to, to have pride in your appearance and representation. And as Marlon spoke about, she's also very um, aware of the power of accent. She's aware, aware of what it means to have a thick Glaswegian accent. And she sees that everybody that has power doesn't talk like that. They talk like BBC newscasters. And so she adopts that. It's a very fake thing for her, but she adopts that and she makes sure she enforces the fact that her, that her children also speak in this way. And that's a conversation about pride and about shame, but it's really a conversation about who has power, who is going places in this world that she is in. And unfortunately, all of these things, all of this pride that Agnes has, this, this daring thing of actually having self-worth makes her incredibly isolated because the people around her understand that she is identical to them socioeconomically, uh, about education attainment level, about the family she comes from, the chapel she goes to several times a week. They know she's the same. And yet she has this audacity to, to be technicolor, to be brighter and to be bolder on the landscape. And ultimately it backfires on her. It, it makes her incredibly isolated and incredibly alone in a time when the community itself is also feeling very alone. And that just really compounds her, her troubles. But she turns to addiction, she turns to alcoholism, which was quite a common thing because it's also a community, a society that is drinking too much anyway. You know, it's, it's a big part of our recreation. And, and we drink too much in a way that sometimes it's hard to know the line between a good time and a bad time. You can't quite find it. And so I think Agnes has sort of gone into addiction for many, many years before someone turns around and, or before she turns around and she realizes, God, I'm in this deep. Um, I mean, it's interesting, like Agnes's physical sexual allure as a, as a woman, um, mm. but then also kind of her glamour are kind of, they're kind of her armour in mm -hmm. a way. Um, and that armor both protects and endangers her to a certain extent because it, it furthers her sense of alienation and it also kind of draws attention or casts more of a kind of like beam on Shuggy's innate difference. Um, uh, they say that uh, um, th there's no cruelty like, 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 like the cruelty of children. Mm -hmm. Shuggy's got a lot to navigate. He's got a mother who he essentially he is parenting from the age of an infant, but he's also navigating a, a lot of marginalization, bullying, physical abuse at school. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. One of the things I wanted to turn on its head is I think, especially in British fiction, when you're writing about working class communities, there's a trope or a cliche that there's always solidarity, that we are together and we're tight and we're, we're all this one beating heart. And that's actually true for many communities, if you can conform within that community. So if you cannot, if you don't uphold the standards of being, for Agnes, first of all, of being a good Catholic pious mother who puts her children first and suffers through everything, then really you're seen as something risky and on the outside. And then for Shuggy in the other way, he's just a young, you know, feminine soul in this place where masculinity is actually pretty narrow. And it's narrow for heterosexual men. One of the things that I had to reckon with with the book is in the first couple of drafts, everything was just happening to Shuggy. You know, people were just being mean because they couldn't understand, or they could understand and they were equating, uh, you know, his effeminacy with, with weakness. And therefore he was becoming a victim because he was on this landscape and he was just a feminine sensitive soul. But then I had to go back and really reckon with how narrow heterosexual masculinity was and even how difficult that was for, for heterosexual men. You know, the men in the book are doing these really dangerous, thankless jobs. They could be killed any moment, whether they're going down a coal mine, whether they're building a ship on staging that's 80 feet in the, the air, they're not paid a huge amount. You know, we never stop in the book, we never stop in the community to say, 
how are you feeling? You know, are you, are you vulnerable? Are you scared? Do you want to do that again tomorrow? Do you have any other dreams? Do you have poetry in your soul? Do you want to play in a band? We just expected our fathers and our brothers and our uncles to get on with it and to do it. Because actually, if you open that up, what man would want to go a mile and a half into the earth and sit in the darkness all day when he could be crushed or suffocated? So, you know, the men around Shuggy become incredibly stoic, incredibly tight. And that's a way of coping. That's a way of them dealing with their trauma. And so I wanted to write about this young boy that doesn't have that. He's just, he's so infected, affected by his mother's manners, her, his mother's sense of uh, glamour, which becomes a precociousness with Shuggy, that he's just so conspicuous on the landscape. And he's pre-sexual, so he has no sexual desire. I wanted to really hold back on that with Shuggy because I wanted this really to be almost an assault on femininity for both Agnes and Shuggy. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's very interesting. Although as, as the novel progresses, when Shuggy is still a child um, or a, uh, a young adult, let's say, he, he does become conscious of the fact that perhaps his body maybe the only currency he has to get himself out of certain situations i mean it, i mean it, it's it's that intense i mean uh, mm -hmm. that that's what kind of he's been reduced to i mean he, he doesn't have any other resources um i'm yeah. thinking about the taxi, think about the taxi journey when mm. um, when agnes you know finally um sends him on his way mm -hmm. um and i'm not sure quite sure how old is he at that point but i mean he, he's not older than 15 and he can't he's pay not, for his no no, and, and so part of the part of what I wanted to show in the book is how this echoes through time. You know, it really begins with Lizzie when we learn about her story when Willie's at wartime and she's she needs to survive. And and certainly Shuggy has seen his mother resort to this many times when she runs out of money or she needs uh, some drink in the house or just the affection of a man. But but sometimes sex is not just about recreation or about pleasure, but it's it's a way to get through. It's a way to survive. It's a way to get the thing that you need. You know, and it's like the Nina Simone song. Sometimes the only thing these characters have is their body and, and they know how to use it. You asked that about Agnes earlier. And, you know, Shuggy has seen this. He's observed this with his mother. And so he does it very reluctantly. And thank goodness that, you know, the taxi driver rebuffs him with it. But I'm not sure it is about sexuality with Shuggy. I think it's a survival thing. I think it's, he thinks, I don't have anything other than this physical form. Would you like it? Would you, do you want it? Um, and thank God the grown man says no. And that's a weird thing for you to say at 15 years old. Um, thank God he, he finds the right person. But he certainly learned that as a coping mechanism. Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think potentially he has learned it because he's, he's seen it throughout right. his childhood. Um, that's right. um, uh, and I think we can't judge that. I think one of the things I wanted to do in the book is, is not to like have the characters do something like that and then have us be, oh, that's terrible. Because actually when you're in that situation and without over confessing, I have been in that situation. You just have to do it because we have to get through whatever it is we're getting through. And so I don't want anyone to, you know, I can't help if readers bring their morals and they judge Agnes or Lizzie or Shuggy in those moments. But I certainly, as the writer, don't. No, I mean, like, you know, it's 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 a very powerful exploration, especially in relationship to Agnes, of domestic violence and mm -hmm. and of, you know, sexual abuse and rape. Um, uh, I mean, in exploring those themes, did, did you did you do much research? I mean, did you have anxiety about how you were going to frame those themes? Because, I mean, it, it's pretty impactful in the book. Yeah, it's a book about vulnerability and about isolation. And actually, as Marlon had said earlier, you know, I didn't necessarily, I didn't think of it as the other. When I was writing the book, I was writing the book without any expectation of what a middle class reader would see, without any knowledge that their life was so hugely different to my own and my own community and my own mother's struggle with addiction. I just wrote what was real and I just wrote it as life without any idea that I was going to scandalize or upset a middle class reader or, or make people feel uncomfortable. I, you know, even in growing up as a kid, I didn't really know I was that poor until I became an adult and I got to look back. I didn't know that not everybody lived with these struggles because it really was everywhere within the housing scheme that I lived on. And there was an enormous amount of comfort for me in that, you know, it's part of it was ignorance. Part of it was the fact that I had no mobility. I couldn't see a broader world until I was about 18. 
but that also gave me a lot of of comfort and it was just life in a way really you know it wasn't me trying to make a huge statement and so when I was writing the book I wanted to present it as eye level as possible without scandalizing it without sensationalizing it this just happens if you are a mother and you are vulnerable and uh, the men on the landscape can see that can sense it and I don't even think it's the fact that Agnes is a very beautiful woman because I think sometimes men would take advantage of everybody that they could if they could um, I don't think it's about beauty or desire I think it's just about vulnerability and it's also the book is an awful lot about where does trauma go when you have no resources to to dispose of it you know we live in a world now I hope where many people can give it away through conversation through expression through therapy through even a medical health system and at the time there was no such thing there was nowhere for it to go and you were really meant in a way to get through life without without any sense of self-pity so there's an awful lot of swallowing of trauma in the book and and there's strength in that I don't think it's healthy but I think the way that Agnes and Shuggy sort of dust themselves off and just get up and keep going is is commendable on some level completely I mean like you know literature should enthrall and delight us but I mean it's not doing its job if it doesn't challenge us um, it's not doing its job if it doesn't terrify us, um, because it means that we're getting an insight into, you know, difficult truths. And that's the essential, that's an essential purpose of literature and all art. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and, and as Marlon said earlier about uh, what Toni Morrison was saying, you know, write the book that you, you want to see in the world. There was so much silence about growing up in a community that was suffering with this poverty, this addiction. Uh, you know, the, the homophobia I felt as a young man. And we were taught to keep it silent because there was, a, you know, class was such an oppressive structure, but also the idea of pride and shame, you know, it was a shameful thing not to be working class, but to be poor. It's a shameful thing to have a mother that's fallible, to be queer at the time. And so the silence around my childhood, the, the amount of things that I was meant to just accept, absorb, and then shut my mouth about was was so overwhelming and and literature gives you the power to write about things you're not often allowed to talk about you know and so that's what I wanted to do with Shuggy. Um, um, Shuggy is such a, a, a memorable character and I was thinking about him and thinking about his dislocation and and how he doesn't really have a, a stable um, male figure in his life and then I kind of caught myself um, mm. and um, you know, there, I'm sure there are lots of discussions of, uh, of this novel and perhaps his brother Leek doesn't get the attention he deserves in this novel because this is a character going through and having had experienced very similar familial trauma. Um, can we just take a moment to talk a little bit about Leek? Oh, we could take a whole, we could take hours and he's my favourite character. And I think he's, a, you know, he's, Sometimes I get accused of writing heterosexual men that are all hard. And actually, Leek's a heterosexual man, and he is this font of saintly, uh, I don't know, love and compassion. You know, Leek is the middle child, and he has been, as Marlon said, he, he is constructing a family that he does not have in, in that way. And he's stepping into this role where he becomes the man of the house. He becomes Shuggy's, not his older brother, but his father, his friend, his mentor. His, his guide, his Sherpa. And I was thinking a lot about the, the eternal challenge for young working class men to ascend to education, to, to have that moment to breathe and invest in themselves. You know, it's Jude Foley and Jude the Obscure, it's Billy Casper in Kestrel for a Knave. And sometimes working class men just don't get that moment. You cannot worry about four years into your future when you've got to worry about today and about Friday. And my God, does Leek have to worry about today with his mother and with his younger brother? And he makes the biggest sacrifice in the book. You know, he, he forgoes his own potential. He has so much potential. He could be a young British art star today if he was a real person. He is so capable. And yet he cannot get there because he has to look after his mother and his brother. And he never tells them he does it. You know, he, he bears that burden in silence. And that's such a sacrifice to make. But he's a wonderful role model, I think, for Shuggy. Except sometimes people get it sort of misunderstood because he, he obviously has that scene in the book where he teaches Shuggy how to walk like a man, how to kick his legs a bit wider, make room for his, you know, for his, let's call it genitals, you know, just to take up more space in the world the way heterosexual men are supposed to. 
And people think, God, maybe that was an act of homophobia. And I think actually, I don't think it was at all. I think it was an act of support for his younger brother. Because from Leek's point of view, he can see an adult world where young working class men cannot be happy and be gay. Um, he hasn't yet seen the 90s or, you know, the 2000s or the 2020s. He just sees today and all he wants for his for his younger brother, Shuggy, is to be happy and to be safe. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's trying to protect him. I think he's he trying is, to make yeah. him less of a target from the bullying that's going around him. I think he's that's right, a yeah. passionate character. And the bullying so, I mean, the bullying is so, I guess, eye level. It's so basic. You know, it's an assault just on on gender i think it's not about sexuality but it's just it's about like looking along a line of things that are all one way and then seeing the one thing that's not that way and it's shuggy is so conspicuous i didn't want to wrap it in religious ideals i didn't want to wrap it in sexual desire because actually it wasn't like that it was almost so sophomoric you know it was so childish it was just why are you feminine why are you such a sissy why are you like this and of course shuggy until that happens to him, has no idea that he's different because like all children, he is just this soul, this very pure soul. We, uh, we touched on it earlier, but I think I want, want to speak a little bit more about kind of um, the portrayal of generational po poverty in, uh, in, in the novel. Um, as colonialism sets a backdrop for, uh, for Marlon's novel, um, sort of Agnes's and Shuggy's story is strongly influenced by uh, the ramifications of Thatcherism in Scotland in the 1980s. Mm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how they are impacted by the politics and the political decision making of their time? Yeah, well, I think that one of the things I wanted to do, I don't know if I succeeded, but what I tried to do is actually there isn't yet intergenerational poverty for Agnes. They don't have much. Agnes doesn't have much, but she has what she needs. You know, everybody she is a woman in a marriage and her parents are both working. She's working, her eldest, her kids are working, you know, so they have what they need. And then suddenly everything flips. Mm. And it's a question about the remote politics. It's about empire. You know, it's about Westminster suddenly not needing Glasgow anymore or not needing industrial communities across Britain. Mm. And so they just turn it off. They, they pull away all support and then they ignore it for, for 20 years, maybe even more. And it was that feeling of, of, of sort of being abandoned in that way. But Agnes finds herself tossed aside by her husband, by the community, by the fact that she uh, hadn't sort of invested in herself. And then the intergenerational poverty starts with her. You know, she's the first uh, generation of her family plunged into that type of poverty. And it will, of course, continue for Shuggy, because here he is, you know, a young man who's orphaned at 16, who hasn't had the opportunities that middle class kids have. And now he's got to figure out what he's going to do with his life. And that's why I leave the book on the moment that it is, because I want readers to, to be a little bit responsible for imagining what a future for Shuggy and Leanne will be. You know, they certainly go dancing into the, into the sunset. You know, they're going, to, they're going to cope in the best way that they can. But Shuggy has to overcome this hard start in life, how far behind the starting line he is. Will he have access to education? Will he overcome sort of his sexual barriers? Will he, you know... Will he get out of that bed set that he's in? And that's really where you start to see intergenerational poverty start, where it really just shoves Shuggy so far behind the starting line for a bright future. I wanted to speak to both of you in conjunction uh, briefly um, uh, about um, uh, the Commonwealth, LGBT rights, um, um, but then also about participation in the Commonwealth. I mean, Marlon, I'm... Uh, conscious that part of the uh, the visuals around the uh, Queen's Jubilee were um, uh, Kate and William's visits to Jamaica and I wanted to speak that disaster I, w I wanted to speak briefly about um, how that went down in Jamaica mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and responses to that and what the implications are in terms of um, uh, thinking and attitude in Jamaica to the uh, to uh, the uh, the, 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 um, Jamaica being a member of the Commonwealth in the future. Sure. You know, the British wonder is well, we will. Um, you know, it's, it was interesting for me contrasting William's visit to Jamaica with Harry's visit to Jamaica. You know, Harry, Harry left Jamaica and adopted Jamaican. We couldn't get enough of him. Uh, you know, Jamaicans adore him. And, I th and it's not just because he's a nice, because he's the second, he's second, he, he gets to be free in a way that um, the queen does. That's why, you know, 
Princess Margaret sparkles on the crown because she's Princess Margaret. So there is that. But I think also there was with him an understanding of where we are. And I think I think the 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 the, the William and Kate's visit smacked of them trying to recapture something that left as soon as whoever came in sixty two. I can't remember if it was Margaret or the Queen left. And I don't think they understand that. Um, there is a lot of blood. There is a lot of tears in the relationship between Britain and the Commonwealth. But the fact is, it is a relationship. Um, I am not crazy about the way in which you know. Um, Jamaica and Nigeria are thrust together, but we're together. And I think that that in itself is interesting and in itself is, in, is important. It will always be a complicated relationship, but complicated means that there's good as well. And I'm not trying to put a rosy picture on, on Commonwealth because anybody who knows me knows I have almost nothing good to say about empire. Um, but I also recognize that there, there is a communication that happens and that it has been happening, particularly in literature and particularly in the arts, that I think is healthy and strong. And I think it encourages a kind of dialogue that we have had before. It certainly, it certainly is an avenue. You look at the the um the the books that made the list of the jubilee read and even some of the criticisms of that list which i see but what the criticisms are ignoring is that it's one thing to talk to the commonwealth but maybe the commonwealth should talk to you and i think that it's it's i think that's that's a i think that's a brand new thing for me it may be a brand new thing for a british reader I, 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 I've seen some people say that the list is a smacking of political correctness, which is really interesting because these are formerly British colonies. These are, are, are the countries that you should know about and the books you should have read. And here is the Commonwealth speaking back to you. And I think um, we, have nothing, we, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain from just listening. Are there any particular favorite novels of yours, favorite books of yours on that, that list of 70 books, Marlon? I, you know, the funny thing is, of that my, and, and, and yet my favorite book, not favorite book, but one of the books that jump out to me in this is actually a British book about British Empire, Wolf Hall, which is a book I constantly reread and I'm constantly in awe of, and I'm still amazed that she pulled it off. Um, actually, I'm not amazed. I've read I've read most of Hilary Mantel's work now. I'm not surprised she you know pulled it off. There is you know Chimamanda's uh, uh, you know Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's book Half of a Yellow Sun, which um, in a lot of ways helped me to write Book of Night Woman. Um, you know there is I love that there is also it's not just fiction. Um, Derek Walker's Omerus is on this. Becca Lamb is a novel that we all grew up with, you know, in, in Jamaica. Um, the Memory of Love by Aminata Foreigner. Um, Bernadine Ivaristo, who I've been reading since she wrote The Emperor's New Babe. Um, you know, Douglas's book, Damon Galgut, um, you know, who <laughs> may be the most overdue Booker Prize ever. Um, and so on, you know, it's, it's, it's a, so many of these books are the reason, add up to the reason why I write books. And um, it's, it's, you know, we can, lists are by their nature subjective. You can make an, you can make an, an identical list of books that have, that should have been here. Just as so you can easily, I, I, I'm the biggest fan of not the booker. <laughs> I'm the biggest fan of that thing, um, you know, because I think it's it's once you realize that lists are by their nature subjective, and start to look at these books on their individual merit, you realize you have nothing. There's nothing but treasures here. Douglas, I wanted to come to you um, and speak about LGBT rights in the Commonwealth. Um, 35 of the 54 member states in the Commonwealth have laws that criminalize homosexu homosexuality in some form. Do you think um, the issue around kind of um, homosexuality um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the legal status um, of homosexual acts in certain countries in the Commonwealth, do, do you think the attempt to try and kind of 
reform this legislation in a way could kind of endanger the the existence of or the participation of those countries in the Commonwealth going forward. It's, it's a very thorny issue, you know, trying to suggest to certain countries that their, their policy about homosexuality, about lesbian gay rights, could be perceived to be almost a, a form of, of kind of neo-colonialism neo coming back again. After we've exported these awful penal laws when we colonized, mm -hmm. um, there can be I, I can understand there being some degree of kind of antipathy towards I know, countries like the UK then kind of like preaching about LGBT rights to, to other nations. Um, it, it's a bit of a difficult issue. I just wondered um, if you had any thoughts on it. Well, I hadn't really thought about it before today, but I think the export of human rights is the right kind of thing to be trying to, to share around the world. I think human equality, I think safety and dignity for all citizens of a country are essential things. And so if we're going to be exporting anything as, as a, a former empire, then let it be that. Let it be that we're asking for everyone to be treated fairly, to be equal in the societies that they're in. Um, I think, you know, that that's an incredibly important thing. And I think the future belongs to countries that treats everyone that lives in that country fairly. And so I would want the Commonwealth to get there. I would want every country in the world, no matter where you are, to, to be there, to have fair rights for women, to have fair rights for LGBTQ people. And I was actually in Poland recently, and I was talking about Young Mungo, my next novel. And Poland was a country that's having a difficult time with traditionalism. It's a very conservative country at the moment. And the LGBTQ community feel very under attack and very threatened there. And I tried just as a way to inspire people to say, look, I wrote a book that sets, takes place in Glasgow in the early 90s. When I was growing up, when I was 15, I couldn't imagine the, the amount of human progress that would come to the United Kingdom. You know, I grew up in a time under Section 28, the fear of AIDS, where uh, the, you know, the, the age of consent was 21, where, where misogyny and uh, bigotry and homophobia were very casual everyday things throughout the nation. And now I'm so incredibly proud to see how far the United Kingdom has come, especially Scotland, and especially to see that Glasgow was voted, I think, the eighth best place in the world to be, to live, if you're a queer person. So I think the, the potential for progress is always there, and I would hope that everyone, that everyone wants that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I would, I would hope so too. Um, 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 I, you know, the Commonwealth is a, is a bonding um, uh, an, organization, an organization that bonds different countries, um, and uh, and uh, I I really hope that, um, uh, that the people's rights and well-being can be protected in in the Commonwealth and in all parts of the world. But I'm also aware that it's you know it's it's a politicized issue. I don't know if you're aware of the book uh, um, The Pink Line by Mark Gervaisa. Um, um, it's such an interesting book about kind of the politicization of, of, of homophobia in different countries around the world. Um, uh, um, um, it's, an, it's a fascinating yeah. read. I haven't read that book and, and you're right that it's a political issue and it doesn't have to necessarily concern the Commonwealth. I mean, look at how queer rights are being politicized in America right now, how there's so many things that are on fire in this country, the economy, women's rights, everything else. And yet we're going to a place of hate where we're almost trying to distract the population by blaming all the woes in society on uh, queer advancement, on LGBTQ advancement. And, and that's, uh, you know, this is in America, this is one of the most supposed to be one of the most liberal countries in the world. So it's a thing that we always have to be hyper vigilant against. We heard a little bit from Marlon um, about what some of his favorite authors and favorite writers are on that amazing list of 70 books, um, uh, many of which I haven't read and some of which I haven't even heard of. So um, it's, a, it's a fantastic education for me to go through this list. Can you talk about some of your favorites? Yeah, it introduced me to a lot of new writers, but I couldn't start without saying, obviously, I'm an enormous Muriel Spark fan. Uh, I think Muriel is one of my favorite writers and I love Girls of Slender Means, um, but you could almost put any Muriel book on that list, I think. Um, I am an enormous fan of uh, Bernadine, as Marlon spoke about, uh, and also Anouk Arud Pragrasam. I thought A Passage North was, was a spectacular book that just really made me feel like I was in Sri Lanka and really immersed me, immersed me there. And, 
And A Clockwork Orange is actually a book that I think has had a huge influence on my own work. I write a lot about violence. I, I write about men on the fringe of society. And I like how that was such a watershed, how that was such a moment culturally in the United Kingdom. And that brings me to a book that, you know, that I think should be on the list. And I think Train Spotting is a book that should be on this list. I think very few books have had a cultural impact, have spoken so clearly about uh, the nihilism and the, the cynicism of the 1990s for young men in Scotland. And, and obviously it's had such a global impact. So I would have loved to have seen Train Spotting on the list. It's a difficult book. Uh, but it's it's an incredibly powerful book and very, very important. I'd just like to say thank you so much to Douglas Stewart and to Marlon James for such a fascinating discussion about these amazing books. Um, uh, you can find out more about the Big Jubilee Read at bbc.co.uk forward slash arts and reading groups could find resources for all 70 books on the list at readinggroups.org. A book from each decade on the list is being featured on BBC Two's Between the Covers, which you can catch on iPlayer. Um, you can get these books from your local library or your local bookshop. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you to the Arts Council England for making this event possible. It was a joy. Um, uh, thank you again to Marlon and to Douglas. And thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>